Heavenly Father, let your spirit fall down on this house. Let your spirit enter this house. Let it enter our hearts, Father. Father, soften our hearts so that we can just open ourselves up to you, that we can be transparent, that we can get ourselves in a season, in a moment to, to be refreshed, to be renewed, to be restarted, refired up, Father. Father, this world can be trying. This world can be tough. It can be hard. It can be complicated. It can be frustrating. But, Father, you make things all new. There is hope. There is joy. There is peace found in you, Father. Father, as parents in this room, help us be that light to our children. And let our children be that light in their schools and with the, those that are around them, Father. Use us. Spirit, come into our lives. Let us open ourselves up to experience what you have in store for us. Let us cast off what the world says we are and start believing in who you say we are. Father God, you are amazing. And we just pray that we have a moment with you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. But So going on, we talk about qualifiers, and we think about what qualifies us. And we think about, so we did that a little, and honestly, I think that that says something to us. When you think, I know it's silly, and I use a cereal box, and I really do love Fruity Pebbles, so you guys can judge me for what you want. I absolutely love this. I love Fruity Pebbles, I love Fruit Loops, I love... Um, I do like, like, I like some healthy stuff. Kicks, is that right? Kicks is old school kicks. I like life cereal. Sugar sure. in a bottle. Lots of different things. I mean, listen, I'm going to go out. I might as well go out like with some sugar in a box. I like some sugar. Oh, you like it too. Yeah, really. But you think about labels. And it's so easy to think that it's just a, a, a youthful thing uh, in the school experience, how we don't suffer from peer pressures at work, or we don't suffer from peer pressure in church, or we don't suffer with those things, but I, labels have a huge thing when it comes to qualifying us, and, and who we are, and what we believe, and honestly what we do, and so I just think it's a natural progression of life that we put a label on it, we put a label on everything, we, you know, a label, just like Bryce said, which is so cool that he knows that, it's supposed to tell us what's in a product, it's supposed to tell us something about something, it's, uh, a label is identifiable, it's, it makes it stick out when you're driving down the road and you see a Chick-fil-A label, a, a, a sign, you know that that's Chick-fil-A and it's going to be good, you know, uh, your favorite pizza shop, you know by based off the label and the branding what it is, you go in like Carrie said, a Snickers bar, I don't think she's ever read the, the wrapper of a Snickers bar to know what's in a Snickers bar, but you know, you know what's in it, you're, you, you, it's, the label tells you something, and we put labels on it. Sometimes we put labels on it because it's the law, and you have to put a label on something. But I think in the natural progressions of our life that we put labels on things. kind of goes back to our last series when you think of what your foundation is built off of, what your principles are built off of, um, influences the labels that we put on various things and ultimately people. And so I think is when we go into this whole idea in this whole series of, uh, of what qualifies us, that's something that you have to hang on to. And when I and to make that even more transparent, so that we understand that, like when you're in your adolescence, like or your youth, just like uh, uh, our our kids, you know, I, I'm going to focus on the high school thing, but you can still see it in um, our middle schools and our elementary schools. You know, you have the smart kids and the, the arts kids and the music kids and, and um, the, the sporty kids and uh, the bad kids. And, you know, I mean, aren't those labels that tend to, tend to stick with kids? And even as adults that work with students, like, you know, but I don't want that kid. That's a bad kid. That's a bad kid. You know, how destructive is that if we go ahead and label? Kid that, and we'll get more of that. Or you know, when you get to high school, it even gets even worse when they, you know, when you really do start seeing the separation between groups of students, and you see like all the all the baseball players hang out together. A lot of times, all the, all the athletes hang together. Um, now you'll see the the band kids and the and the um, music and the, the like. And here, Jefferson County, our pop singers. They all like they all. Then you got the drama kids and. And then you got them all pitted against each other because they've labeled each other different name, names. And forgive me for saying like that band nerd over there or that jock over there. Or he's dumb. And, and or yeah, I think of those things all the time as you hear them in school. And I don't. We all deal with them. Uh, maybe you don't want to go back and think about how you may have been picked at or picked on or something like that. Um, I remember being at school 
Um, I came, my parents were awesome. Um, they pushed us to be involved in a lot of different things. Um, never let us quit anything, but it pushed us to try lots of things. So all of us uh, went through various sports and all of us, I don't know if it's a rule for my mother, but just put us into music. We all learned music. Right? My sisters all danced. We all um, did stuff like that. But I remember when I got to high school is when it really started becoming an issue. Like guys would say, like, you're, you're in choir? Like, who, what are you, who does, who does that? Like, who does that and plays basketball and, and does, and so, um, I remember that, I, that, that, those were constant things. And I'll say this for anybody that ever hates on music. I traveled more and did more and experienced more, um, being in the arts in high school than I ever did with sports. And I love sports, but I, I had so many opportunities because, my mother guided us all into that direction, and it was awesome. It was an awesome experience. But I remember that the labels that were labeled on me, which I was a very resilient kid back then. Like, it didn't matter. I didn't care. It didn't bother me what anybody thought of me. But I remember um, in my high school, uh, our, our conductor, uh, um, uh, uh, she was awesome, 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 influential woman in, in my life. Uh, she would make us sing the national anthem and quartet. We didn't have, like, if you go to schools now, they always play the, the national anthem over the thing. She made me sing. Like, we had to go to every event, and we sang. So I remember that it was my turn, and I think I was a sophomore, and went, and I went, and I was saying, you're not playing. I'm like, how's this going to work? I, I, I always use that as an excuse, because we let our labels scare us out of doing things, too. And I also didn't want my buddies seeing that label out loud. Like, they knew, but I know, like, I don't really want you to see the label. Like, I just, I'd rather hide in the shadows. And, and I remember us saying uh, in my uniform at center court and with, with uh, three other people. And, and after that, though, I remember going over and, and, and the guy's like, oh, let's not do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and we'll let you be for a little bit. But, but we do that, right? Uh, how about in your young adulthood? Man, do we have some words for, I'm so sorry, Lauren, but man, do we have some words for young adults? Don't we? As old adults, we look at young adults and we start hating them. And we start labeling them, right? Like, this next generation, like, what's going on? Like, every, so apologize to you, Lauren, every generation does that. Because my parents looked at me and said, oh, we're hopeless. Like, this, this country's going, where this world's going down the, the, the tank. You know, their parents looked at them. I, I, I went to a training, and they really talked about that. I absolutely loved it, because every generation always looks at the generation behind us and says, oh, my gosh, what is going on? Because, you know, we change. We evolve. We can learn different things, more technology, new things that are going on. We continuously change. But, man, do we really hate on young adults, and we label them. Uh, like, And they're not all bad, right? So you, some of us might look at some. Some would say they're freeloaders, they're lazy, they're, you know, uh, uh, not tapping into uh, any of the resources, you know, got that. But then we got some of them called hard workers. How about maybe another bad one that you've heard, and forgive me for saying, stoner, look at that stoner, hasn't grown up yet, hadn't let it go, like, you know, um, a drunkard, you know, sometimes we see that with college kids, like you see that at college all the time. Um, and you just know that that's a drunkard guy, that, that guy right there, that's the party. A partner. He's never going to make that 9 a.m. class. He's never going to be in that seat. Um, uh, how about then? Then if you're not the partier, then you're the no fun. Like you just don't do nothing. You're the mama's boy. You're the you're, you're just the goody two shoes that just goes to class and goes to work and does the right thing. Or you know, and, and is that not that really affect our youth? I think uh, you know the pressures we put on our youth, uh, our young adults regarding ministry, regarding Christianity, regarding God, regarding, uh, man, does that have an influence on them and the direction that they choose in their life or the commitment that they choose to make? Because I think that sometimes as the church, we sell them short and hold them more accountable than we hold ourselves at times, and which does destruction to God's kingdom. Uh, we, you know, going from the, uh, then, you, then there's those young, those driven adults, there's young adults that are just driven, like you know right off the bat, you mean like, um, I'll say this about Ethan. I've seen so much maturity in my, my 20 and my 19 year old that um, two years of college, like I've never, like he came home from summer and just worked his tail off. Like I've never, I'm not saying he was ever lazy, he always worked, but like to actually see him like do a soccer stuff, but then like have a drive to go out and work and learn something about the business world and follow his stepdad around and, and learn from him. It's pretty impressive. He's driven. He wanted to learn something. 
you know. So we have that. And adulthood. Maybe we step it up a little with our labels in adulthood. Like, uh, you're successful. Or you're not. You're not successful. Or, or you're a waste. Like, man, he had everything, but he wasted it. She wasted it because of her choices and her decisions. Like, she's just, she's wasted it all. Or, you know, you got that the family man, family woman. I mean, they're just family-centered, and you've got all this stuff. Or how about a uh, snobbish? You know, you go to the golf course, you feel like everybody's looking at you and, and like judging you because you don't know how to swim a golf club. That's in there. Yeah. Kind of embarrassing, I understand that. It's, I'm learning, you know. It is not that label something that'll keep me from even trying because I'm scared of what somebody's going to label me as or say it about me. Uh, poor, rich, you know, uh, person of influence, somebody that's shady, that dude right there always been shady. Don't mess with them. All these, I mean, is it, I know you guys would never do that. I know I've never done that, but you know, you know, do we not, you know, we put labels on some of those probably right about something. Like you've done it. It's just something we do. We put labels on it. We, we put labels on it and we put labels on it because it, 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 it says something to us. It speaks to us. It tells us what we want to accept and what we want to receive and what we want to reject and what we qualify. Based off what we see. And what we should know, at least everybody in this room, and I know that there are some young followers of Christ, but that we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. That not always what we see on the outside is what is on the inside. And many of the things that we see on the outside rob us of the opportunities to experience what's on the inside. Because you can't see people's hearts like God can. But yet I know my God says that each and every one of us is a child of God. But we, as human beings, can't get past the flesh. Because we put labels on it. And so we won't cross over to experience what somebody has in their heart. And that may even be that challenging side. And man, I can't wait to dive into this story. This is honestly going to be my favorite Sunday uh, through this whole series. But we can't even get past um, the idea of you know, how dirty Willie may be. And so we stay away from Willie because of his choices and his decisions. Like he's one of those people that I looked at as like he's such a waste. But yet you've never taken the opportunity to have a conversation with him to really see what's on the inside. And maybe all he needed was somebody to talk to. I mean, we let later. I think of the environment we work in and how many times labels that adults put on students keep us from making a bridge and building a relationship. And helping a kid, oftentimes uh, for our young adults and for, or just for human beings in general, and relationships that often people are one relationship away from really experiencing success. Success as in moving forward in life. People get stuck because of their labels, and more so, and in in when they're young, or when you're in your impressionable age of. Um, now, in your young adulthood, when you see other people like, I'm supposed to be this, I'm supposed to be that, I'm supposed to be this, and so then you start rushing through things because you're trying to force things. I need to get married now, I need to have a baby now, I need to have a job now, like I, instead of, you know, because these are all these labels that keep getting thrown at us, and you want to you wanna live up to those labels. I think that's where we find Saul. Remember we left Saul? And we, we, we told the story of Stephen, the, one, of the, one of the ten, or one of the seven, uh, that the apostles that bring in and they rose up to help care for the new church, the, the new church that they called the way. And Stephen was so filled with the Holy Spirit that he wasn't afraid to speak truth. And remember, like, he was challenged, he was seized by the Pharisees, and he's put in front of them. And they, uh, just like they did Jesus, they encouraged and influenced others to lie on, on Stephen, but yet Stephen went back down. And Stephen, when looked at these qualified men, remember these are qualified men, these are men of great influence, men of great education, in a time where a lot of people couldn't read. We take for granted that our children get to go to school and we teach them how to read and they can read scripture freely. But in those days, the only time you could experience or see or hear uh, the Torah or hear uh, anything from God was from a qualified <clears throat> person. But here, Stephen, this unqualified man, looks at these qualified folks that are accusing them and hating on him, and he just gives them the history of, uh, of Israel. 
and lays it down. And then ultimately, they're still frustrated with him. And then we left off where they martyred him. He is the first martyr for, for Christ. And he's martyred and he's beaten. And we left off right here with Saul. Saul in the, in the, the verse, uh, the end of chapter 7 and moving into chapter 8, verse 1. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats. So as they are stoning uh, Stephen, they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. I know some of you know who Saul is, and that should mean something to you. Because, man, like, and let me, let me, so we left off on that cliffhanger. Let's continue the story here in chapter 8, uh, going through the uh, uh, first three verses. And Saul approved of their killing him, killing Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Uh, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. I mean, he sought out to destroy the church. Great persecution has begun. And he goes out to the... How would you label Saul? Man, if you talk about your profession and how you do your job and what you do, how are you labeled? I know big words in, in my profession are honor, integrity, um, are reasonable, you know, different things like that. But then uh, on the other spectrum, people will call me a bully, power hungry, ego driven, right? Well, how about how about this guy right here? Saul. Saul was an educated. He's educated man because he's one of the Pharisees. He's one of their top men. He's a, a do right to some because he's. He's following the religious leaders, the religious law of the day. Like I am, now he's a doer. He's a zealot because he's like so fired up. And zealot eventually turned into something a little bit, a lot different. Uh, but uh, zealot, as in the, 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 the idea that he is pursuing it, like he is out to destroy. He is going after it. Um, he's a diehard. He's he's young. Scripture tells us he was young, impressionable, and maybe his son is a killer. He's a murderer. He's ruthless. He's, I mean, I guess it depends on what side you're on, right? What perspective is the right one? What's, what's, uh, but what does it, I mean, what, who's right? I mean, doesn't our perspective matter when we think about people's labels? Saul believed he was doing the right thing from his perspective, from the Pharisees' perspective, from religious uh, followers of the day. His perspective is right. He's doing good. He's protecting the temple. He's protecting the law. I mean, this uh, we take for granted sometimes when we go back and read the Old Testament, and that's why it's so important um, to remember the context of why we are reading it and what it is saying. And Because to us, sometimes, like, we look at the Old Testament, it doesn't make sense to us. And we look at the Old Testament and what they did, and then we look at the Gospel, and we like, like I remember Acts didn't make a lot of sense to me. Because why would they do that? Like you, you know he came back. Like why would you go out? Why do you not believe? How has your heart been so hardened that you are just out to stamp it out and, and don't believe? But their perspective was different. See, religious leaders and the rule followers of the day uh, the, believed that, 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 that Jesus was, was not who he was. And so Saul... He's going out to stamp it out. He's going out to take care of it. And, and to the followers of the way, the early movement, the early church, that, that Acts, uh, the early church in Acts that we're reading about, I mean, to a new Christian, I mean, Saul is a persecutor, a murderer, a tormentor, a non-believer. And can we even say he's blind? He's blind. And we see that Saul is just, just uniquely qualified at this moment in his life, to persecute the church. What I think about Saul at this moment is his labels qualify. Our labels qualify us. Sometimes what we say to somebody is what they believe. I believe what was being told to Saul, what he observed, 
I think it's important to realize when it says he was young, a young man. How impressionable are you as a young person? Like we are so impressionable. Um, I, like even as a as a, and I'm not even saying physical youth. Not even so. I, you know, I'm sure that he was young. I will take scripture for its word. But I'll even say like maybe you're young in a profession. You start a new profession and you're being mentored by an older person that's been doing it a while. So you are like a piece of clay and are picking up on different things. And often what somebody says to you maybe what you're qualified for what you believe you're qualified for. You know what, Aaron, you're not that talented in, in this. I don't think you should be doing that. But you know what? The school education is right up your alley. I think you could do really well relates to the kids getting them out. You know, and, and that's ultimately where you found to play me. You know, uh, I'll wrap my wife up. She's not here watching. She's down with the kids. But I remember the, uh, when I asked her to go to seminary, you know, going and asked to, to, to step off that. And I think some of you have heard me say this before, but I remember my label that she labeled me as right there. Her, her direct response was, why? You're a cop. That was her response to me. You're right. But, I, you, know, that, you know, you believe. We often, like I think what happened to Saul is Saul started believing the labels they were throwing on him. So then he takes it even further. Now he's going to go out and just stamp it out. Going to go out and chase it down. Pharisees are speaking to this young man. Because if there's anything we know about the Pharisees through Scripture, they didn't get their hands dirty themselves. All right? These qualified men used other instruments to go after Jesus. They used other excuses to go after Jesus. They used loopholes. They used manipulation. They used um, money. They used power. They used influence. To influence. And so what I think these qualified men are looking at one of their younger qualified men. And, and so they start speaking to me, hey, Saul, you man, you got this. You can do this. Like you're young. You can chase them down. You can stamp them out. Heck, maybe there's even some promises on this on the other end of this label. Like, listen, you are all these great things. You're young. You're strong. You're convicted. You're, you're, you're the man. Like, have you been told that something like you think you're the man? Come on, all of us guys have been there at one time. Come on, Willie, you can do it. You can do it. And then you, you get talked into it, and you're like, yes, I can. And then the next thing you know, like your back's hurting for three weeks. Like you've done jacked it up, and you like, you know, shouldn't have done it, right? Like, why can't we just be truthful with each other? Willie, you shouldn't do that, like right now. And, and for some of us that are stubborn, that just motivates us anymore. Like, my son, Dad, don't, don't try that. Uh, watch me. I got this, right? But I think... Our, label, our labels often determine what we pursue. It, it, it often determines our pursuits. And that's why I look at like young folks or, or the, the, um, the influence of the church, us as the temple, us as, as God's church and the influence we have on other people. Because often the way that we label people determines what they pursue. And sometimes when, you do, when I label you as a divorcee, or I label you as a widower, or I label you as you're too poor, or I label you as a drunkard or an addict, or you're not good enough, or all these things, or you had a baby before you got married, I mean, we use all these labels, and rather than, we put these false sense, these labels that qualify us. And even though God tells us that they don't qualify us, man, the, the mind is a powerful thing. And what people say to us, one of the best things I, 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 I picked up on early when I went to, to, to school, and I honestly am, am stealing this, so you know, for future land that's watching this, I cannot remember who said this. I, I wish I could. Uh, but it's something I use with our youth. Uh, uh, but I always say that it doesn't matter what people say. It only matters who says it. You think of students and their constant bickering and they're trying to outdo one another. And it's like it. It doesn't matter what Aaron says to you. Is that Aaron a buddy of yours? Is he a, is he a friend? Is he, is, he, is, he, is he family? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people say because people always say things. What matters is who says it. Because you give power to the people that say things. It matters if Willie says something to me because I know Willie knows me. And he respects my family. He's going to speak truth to me. But if I don't know you and you're a complete stranger and you're labeling me as such, then I'm not going to, I'm not feeding that fire. I'm not letting that label qualify me. 
But too often we see the labels in our lives, they ultimately qualify us. And what I mean by that is sometimes those labels, those powerful things that are attached to us, just like Bryce said, like, you know, it's supposed to be this. And so labels speak so loudly because we're not bold enough to cast them off. Because we, don't, we, we believe in what people say, and so often that plants our pursuits. That plans out our future. You know what, I, I'm not good enough. You know, I'm just not good enough, so, you know, I'm just, just going to quit. I, you know what, I'm not going to try and take that promotion test, because I just know I'm good. I'm not, I'm not good, I'm not qualified. You know, I, you know, I'm not even going to put in for that job, because, you know, mom told me that I just, I'm not responsible enough, and I'm not good enough to do this. I mean, do you, can you see how sometimes the things that we say, and even though you may not have attended it as it being a label on somebody, how somebody can just attach that to them. Like I thought about getting stickers, and I think I've seen it done before. Like, but like you, everything you say, something you don't know it's going to stick to somebody when you throw it out there. You don't know that the words that are coming out of your mouth that you throw at somebody, or think of the daily interactions you have at your job. I mean, Aaron and I have a great opportunity because we get to see the same group of people every day. But think of the people that come through your shop on a daily basis. Think of the people that come through your place of business on a daily basis. That every day that you get to say something and you don't know what's going to stick. Did what you say throw out stick? Was it productive or was it, or was it destructive? Because that, what you said about that person might be something that they, they, they qualify them. And I want you to hear me say this, that I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying this is what we do. This is what we do. It's, it's something that we've done for forever, and, it's, and often it's because our labels qualify us, it sells us short. It keeps us from going where God wants us to go, because we're stuck on the labels. Think of those, 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 those people that you know that know Jesus, but they're afraid to get connected to a church because they're afraid and ashamed of the labels that the church has put on. So they're afraid. And so they don't get connected. And they don't go back to a church. They don't find a family that will be truthful to them and speak truth to them and love them with grace. They're stuck in their shame in their labels. They're not meant to qualify us. Labels in all reality, there's only one label and I already gave that away. I shared that with the kids. You know, I mean, that's, it's, it's awful. Like, look, let's move on and continue with Saul. Going into chapter 9, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. I mean, he was, I mean, I don't, man, we, we really underscore how ruthless Saul was. Because of, later on, we, how amazing he is. But I mean, this is scripture. I'm not adding any adjectives in here. I'm not adding anything to this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked for letters from the synagogues in Damascus so that he found, if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Listen, he didn't care if you were a man or a woman. He is stomping you out. He is uh, breathing out murder threats. Like he is coming after the church. He is coming after the way. He pursued because they knew what was I believe that this young man was, was filled up with this. And he's like, I'm going out, I'm going out, I'm going to do it. He's like, it's like, like a bully. Like a bully. A bully only loses their authority when those that he bullies stop paying attention to the bully. So a bully continues to move on to different targets. He keeps targeting because the bully, it keeps him straight. Paul, uh, Saul is going out and just keeps going out and carrying out and going out. But God had different plans. For this man that is out there screaming and yelling murder threats against his people and imprisoning them and taking them and watching people being stoned in front of him. God had different plans. He has different plans uh, for Saul and he has different plans for us, for you and me. You aren't what you are labeled. So I don't know if there's still a label on you that still haunts you from your past or there's a label that is haunting you from your, your future, your present right now, where like at work, maybe they have this fixated on you. Listen, your labels, that's not who you are. That's not who you are. And, and you're uniquely qualified. Just as Paul was, or Saul, man, I'm already telling who he is when he 
you shouldn't know who he is, but that's who he is, so I'm, I'm sorry I'm mixing that up. But Saul um, was uniquely qualified by the Pharisees to go out and pursue, you know, because he was young, he was convicted, he was ready to go. But just as you are uniquely qualified, Saul was uniquely qualified for something God had in store for him. And so that you are uniquely qualified because you are a child, you are a friend, you are an heir. You are justified, you are redeemed, you are accepted, you are forgiven, and you are made new. He's given you a gift, he's given you a calling, he's given you a purpose. And where you are right now is where he wants you to be. It's still one of the most powerful things I've ever read in scripture. Because every day we wonder where God is. And sometimes it just takes us to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, where I am right now is where God wants me to be. Even in the worst of the worst. Even in the worst decision you've ever made. Even in the haunting pressure and weight of the label that you are currently wearing. He can still work with you right where you are. See, oftentimes, the falsehood of believing in God is the fact that you believe that he will miraculously remove every obstacle out of your way. That's not true. The Israelites still had to step on the riverbed. And they still had to cross over. And if they were afraid of what was around them, they would have been swallowed up by the Egyptian army. They still had to move. He didn't pluck them out and move them to the other side, like by, you know, by just like, like Star Trek transporter or something like that. No, they had to keep moving. They had to keep going. I mean, the, that, that, that falsehood sometimes makes us think that, that he's not real. But he is. And ultimately, he's even more real. I, I find that I am closer to God in my moments of distress than in my moments of success. Because in my distress, there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to turn. And so the expect, you know, I have an expectation. And I'm okay with saying that. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with saying that, that my God will provide. And it may not be the expectation that I want or the provision that I want, because I'm sure the you know, Israelites didn't want to do all the walking. I'm sure they wanted to be able to just walk over there. I'm sure they didn't want to deal with the apprehension or fear that there was an army coming after them. I'm sure if they just wished he would have come down and just taken care of it, freaked down, everybody would have been happy. But God has a purpose. God has a plan. And everything that he has done and everything that he will do in your life, he has a plan for your calling, your gift, and your purpose. And he will have his way with you. Period. That's a, that's a complete sentence. You are uniquely qualified. You are not finished. He is not finished with you. Uh, there's a great song, uh, that, you know, as long as I have breath, you know, I still have more work to do. There's more things to do. There's still chapters left in your story. You may have had some awful chapters in your life. I mean, you think of your life story as a story and think of the different various chapters in your life. Well, when you receive Christ, it's time to start writing a new chapter and start following him and walking with him. Despite who you are or what you've done, he's not finished with you yet. Saul was the worst of the worst. Saul was the worst of the worst. He was a murderer. He was a persecutor. He was, I mean, he was a murderous threats against God's early people, and God still wasn't done with him. See, his perspective of the Christ follower, when, when he was about to have an encounter with God that would change him forever. A direct encounter. Saul would no longer be limited by the label that he was given, and neither should you. We pick it up, Acts 9, and this is where I'm going to leave us on, a, on a, another cliffhanger, and we'll pick it up next week. But as he neared Damascus, so he got that letter, and he's heading out to continue his, his murderous threats and his, his mission of, of crushing the church. He's near Damascus on his journey, and suddenly, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Naturally, he goes, well, who are you, Lord? And Saul asked, uh, and he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuted. He replied, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what, what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, did not eat 
A lot of us go through seasons where we let our labels tell us who we are and what we're qualified for. And what I would like to say about that is you're blind. You're blind. I think it's no secret that God uses this and it's in our book, in our, in our word that he has given us in, in our blueprint that he blinded Saul. Because in Saul's perspective, he thought he was right. He thought he was doing a good thing. He thought he was following it through. He was a religious man. He believed in God. He didn't believe in Jesus. God is Jesus. Jesus is God. But he didn't believe. His perspective was wrong. He was blinded. And so God physically made him blind so that he could make him see. And so as I leave us this morning, I challenge like what's going to happen next week to, to Saul is is tear off the label. Stop feeling trapped by the label that you have or what somebody has told you you are or how unqualified you may be or how overqualified you are or or the expectation that you that is on you. Maybe it's the reverse side. I didn't even really talk about that. Or the high praise I have for my son and what I want him to be. Sometimes that can be just as destructive as telling him he's not good enough. Your labels aren't permanent. Like I think, I, I wish I should have done it. Like you know, you think of a soup can and if you kept a soup can for years and years and years, eventually that label is going to deteriorate. It's going to fall off. It's going to go away. Labels aren't permanent. It's not who you are. It's not who you are or what you do. It's who you are. It's whose you are. Sorry. It's whose you are that sets you apart. Labels don't define you. Labels don't define you. They describe you. And we need to be careful about how we describe other people or how we think of other people or how we, again, label people. Because descriptions change. How you describe somebody isn't permanent. I mean, the all telling fact is age. At one point or another, you were young. Descriptions changed. You got old. One point or one day or another, you were thin. Next thing you learn, you know, <laughs> descriptions change. Labels aren't permanent. You can change. The only thing that can't change is what we left with our kids this morning is that you are a child of God. And the light is with inside you if you perceive it. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful to be in your presence this morning. Father, we pray that this, that your words to us, your scriptures, this, this, this journey of Saul's, Father, I pray is speaking loudly to us, that the things that are around us, the people that speak into us, listen, the labels that we are constantly battling, Father, they don't qualify us for what you have in store for us. You are the qualifier. You are the great maker, the great creator, the great, uh, the, the, you know, God, you have told us what we are and who we are. We are yours. We are children of God. There's nothing in this world that can separate us from you. There is no trial, no tribulation, no, no sin, nothing that can keep us from you if we are willing to cast off our blindness, to tear off our labels, and follow you, Father. Father, you said we are redeemed, you said we are gifted, you said we are purpose, we are glorified, we are justified, we are called. Father, we are given a mission by you to go out here and let others know that they are children of the Almighty God. Father, whatever labels we may be battling right now, or whatever pursuits that we may be pursuing. Father, I pray that it makes us turn inward and start thinking about the things that people have said to us. What has stuck to us over the years, Father? Is it what you say we are? The only thing that I know that I am is I know I'm not good enough. But I know you said that I'm loved enough. Father, your truth and your grace is good enough for me. So, Father God, I pray that that message is one that's clear and strong and resounds through our community, through our hearts in this room, Father, and through our families, Father. 
Let us be truth speakers and grace givers, Father, just as you have given us, because we all fall short of the glory, Father, but you have continued to make a way for us. Father, I'm a sinner, but that's not my label. I don't need a label to tell me what I am. And Father, I pray that some of the things that may be projected on the outside of me, Father, can be cast away and burned away and torn away, Father, so that my true heart overflows with the joy and peace and truth and grace that you have filled me with. Father, let me be an image bearer. Let, let us all take on that mantle. I can't make that choice for them, Father, but Father, I pray that they will let the overflow of their hearts speak volumes about who you are in their life, Father. That nothing, no sin, no shame, no regret, no pain will ever separate them or unqualify them from the gift of the everlasting life that you have given to each and every one of us by sacrificing your son that way the cross. Father, speak truth to us. Let us experience that truth and let us be true. Now we want to be. Father, you are amazing. We thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.